G'day, I'm Dr Kev, and in this video we'll be choosing an engine for Project 171. We'll consider its performance, as well as the donor vehicle it's likely to come from, and the level of aftermarket support. We're going to run the options through a decision matrix to be as objective as we can, and then we'll see if in the end I make a rational decision. But don't get your hopes up. Welcome to Car Design Workshop. When considering design options, we want to create a series of criteria to judge the different options against. For this decision, where we're choosing the engine for the vehicle, we're going to be considering performance of the engine, cost, size, availability, the level of aftermarket support available, how suitable the gearbox is, as well as looking at the induction. When it comes to performance, we're mainly concerned with power and the sims indicate that anything above 120 kilowatts should be able to provide a car that can go 0 to 100 in under 6 seconds. Potentially, if the car is particularly lightweight, we might be able to go as low as, say, 75 kilowatts, and this indicates engines that are going to be between 1.5 and 2.5 litres in volume. When it comes to cost, we're going to be considering the cost of a donor car, we're not just going to want the engine, we're going to want a lot of other components as well. So we're going to want a vehicle that's going to be affordable. The size of the engine is going to be fairly important. The bigger the engine is, the bigger the car is likely to be. And the bigger the car, the heavier the car. We also need to make sure that the donor vehicle is readily available. We're going to be getting a second hand vehicle. And we want to make sure there's plenty available so that we can... One, find a good deal, but also have plenty of spare parts when the time comes. Now, the regulations for an ICV, or an individually constructed vehicle in Australia, require that you're going to use an engine that has been built after about the year 2000. And if we're looking at the top selling cars since then, we're going to see things like the Corolla, or a Hyundai Getz, or a Mazda 3, or a Volkswagen Golf, or a Honda Civic, these sorts of vehicles. Now, if we look at a particular year throughout this period, we'll see that Toyota is by far the market leader and has been for quite a long time in Australia. We do have a reasonable market share from Ford and Holden, but this was largely made up of vehicles that are probably not going to be suitable donor vehicles for this particular project. Otherwise, we're looking at a list of largely Japanese or Korean vehicles. Now, another thing we're going to want to consider is the aftermarket support. And this really comes down in two particular areas. One, that we want a readily available source of parts. And the second is that we want to have plenty of information available for the engine for troubleshooting. So ideally, we would see for a particular engine an active online community where it would be possible to get answers as we, we hit problems. When it comes to gearbox suitability, there's far too many automatic gearboxes around. Some of the engines that are available came in donor vehicles that were almost sold exclusively as automatic vehicles. This car will have a manual gearbox and I don't want to have to search forever to find a suitable gearbox. We also want to make sure that the gearbox doesn't really require a lot of modification to be suitable for the vehicle. And the last criteria that I'm interested in is the induction of the engine. Ideally, we'd want an engine that is suitable for either naturally aspirated or being turbocharged. Now, a turbo ends up being a really easy way to significantly increase power if we end up chasing performance. This could even happen well after the car is built and running, say if we want to take the vehicle and prepare it for the track. A turbo also provides a convenient get-out-of-jail-free card if the car ends up being a little bit overweight. Now there's a couple of criteria you might be surprised that I'm not considering. Now the first of these is reliability. Reliability is very important for a vehicle. However, regardless of the engine that we choose, they'll all be likely to be able to last 20 years in a car that's only doing about 5,000 kilometers per year. It's also going to be in a car that's going to have regular service intervals it's going to be the engine will be rebuilt at the start and likely the reliability is going to be more affected by my installation 
than any underlying unreliability from the donor vehicle. Now another criteria that I would love to include would be the weight of the engine. But overall it's difficult to find reliable sources for weights of each engine. You can go through forums and uh, if online information but it's difficult to know whether weights are being stated with or without intakes or with or without exhaust and in the end it's likely that we're going to have similar weights for all aluminium block uh, engines that are of a similar size so while weight is uh, very important we just don't have access to the information that we would need without having a hold of all of the particular engines we're going to consider now before we look at the engines that I'm considering for this vehicle, there's a number of things that I'm not considering. The first of these are the rotary engines. Now rotary engines are great concepts for engines, they're lightweight, they're high power, but I have no experience with rotaries and I have no real desire to be changing apex seals whenever I'm servicing the vehicle. The other problem is it locks you into one manufacturer and relatively expensive donor vehicles. I'm also not going to consider motorcycle engines. Now in this case, unlike rotaries, I have a lot more experience with uh, motorcycle engines in car installations. Uh, they're light, they're powerful, but they're not actually that cheap and there's a lot of driveline modifications in order to get them to work in a car. And one of the advantages of having an engine from a car is that that donor vehicle is going to offer a lot of really useful parts that a motorcycle won't. And lastly, I'm only considering uh, engines with less than six cylinders. That means no LS uh, or any other type of V8. And the idea here is that I don't want the engine to be getting uh, too large or too heavy. And while the V8 engines themselves aren't that much heavier than, say, a four-cylinder engine, you find that the suitable gearboxes are. Now when it comes to the engines that I am considering or we're going to put through this decision matrix, there's a lot of different type of engines out there. And what I've done is chosen five representative engines. For example, there's not that much difference between many of the four cylinder motors of similar size. So I've chosen, say, a four cylinder motor that would be representative of the performance we would expect. So the first engine I'm considering, and the most expensive engine, the most modern engine, would be the Toyota G16e. This was an engine released in 2020. It's one and a half litres in size. It's a three-cylinder motor. Toyota also make an M15 version that they see in, say, a normal Yaris. And so if we look at from anywhere from the naturally aspirated engines to the turbocharged uh, G16e, we'll see a power range between 118 and 305 horsepower. And these engines we'd find in a Yaris or a Corolla. Now the next engine is what I would call the low price, uh, low size four cylinder engine. And that's the Hyundai 1.6 liter engine that you would find in a Hyundai Getz. Now you can get turbos for these engines and the power that we would expect in their different installations goes from about 97 horsepower in a Getz to up to about 132 horsepower. So a fairly low powered engine. The third is the well-known Honda K-series engine. So either a K20 or a K24. These engines have been produced from 2001 and we would see a power range of anywhere from 150 to 320 horsepower. And these engines can be found in Integras, Civics, Accords, but also some uh, bigger cars such as the CRV and the Odyssey. So we've had a three cylinder, a couple of four cylinders. So let's make number four on the list a five cylinder engine, and this is the five cylinder engine from Volvo. These engines have been around since 1997 and were produced up to about 2011, and they come in sizes from uh, two litres to two and a half litres. There's turbo and naturally aspirated engines anywhere from 126 to 350 horsepower and they can be found in just about everything that Volvo made as well as a couple of cars from Ford. Now I've owned a couple of cars that have had this engine in it and it's an absolutely beautiful engine and it sounds fantastic. So we've had inline threes, fours and fives. So let's try something a little bit different with our last option, and that's a Subaru EJ series motor. In this engine, we would have anything from about two liters to two and a half liters in a boxer configuration. 
They're readily available in uh, naturally aspirated or turbo and can see powers before modification of anywhere from 125 to 341 horsepower. These can be found most commonly in Imprezas, Liberties and Foresters. And so now we can construct our decision matrix. We'll list all of the criteria as the uh, rows of this matrix and for each of the columns we'll have one of the options that we're considering. For the sake of simplicity I'm not going to be doing any difference in weighting for them. I'm just going to have each of these criteria worth five points in total. Now in practice a decision matrix is best done with a group of people where you can each uh, sort of discuss the different values of each of the criteria. So you might have unequal weighting for the criteria to end up with a better solution. So starting with performance, pretty much every one of these engines easily hits the performance targets required. So they're all going to get five out of five with the exception of the Hyundai motor. So if we do the traction curve of the Hyundai motor, like in a previous video, we'll actually see that the zero to 100 time is slightly slower than six seconds. Now in reality, we could probably reach what we're after if we focus on reducing the weight and maybe do a little bit of performance enhancement to the engine. But we will give it three out of five. When it comes to cost, the Toyota is by far the most expensive engine. It's the newest engine. The Hyundai is by far the cheapest engine. And the Honda and Subaru are about the same. And the Volvo is slightly more expensive. With the size of the engine, the three cylinder is the uh, smallest of the engines, best packaging engine. And the four cylinders and the Volvo are about the same, but the Subaru is a little bit bigger because it does end up with uh, two heads being in the boxer arrangement. Now availability is pretty interesting. The Toyota motor suffers from being a very modern engine and there's just not that many out on the secondhand car market. In fact, if I did a simple search for this in, say, Facebook Marketplace, there was only one available for sale, and it was $40,000. Now, the Volvo motor was reasonably more available, but if you're looking for the ideal donor vehicle with that, that would be the Volvo C30. And in a manual gearbox, there was only one of those available as well. Now, a Subaru Impreza or a Honda Civic, about the same numbers, about a dozen available at any given time. And you see these go in and out of marketplace quite regularly but the absolute standout was the Hyundai Getz. This was by far the cheapest car and there were over 70 available on a simple look at marketplace. Now when it comes to aftermarket support the Toyota loses out a fair bit because it is so new. The Hyundai loses out a little bit because it just doesn't have that uh, rabid following you see of people after European cars or Japanese cars. And we see by far the best aftermarket support we could expect would be from the Honda and the Subaru out of this list. Now looking at the gearbox suitability, the Toyota here gets a 1 out of 5. The Yaris GR is a all-wheel drive vehicle and we would either need to modify that or find an alternative gearbox. The Volvo also scores quite lowly here just because it's so hard to find manual gearboxes for these Volvos. Nearly all of them sold in Australia were automatics. Now the Hyundai and the Honda both score very highly. The Hyundai obviously because there's quite a lot of them out there. And the gearboxes for the Subaru, there were some front wheel drive versions that are available but they're rare. The reason this would get 3 out of 5 is in order to take the normal gearbox you'd find in a, an Impreza and make it suitable for Project 171, you would need to turn that from an all-wheel drive gearbox into an, a two-wheel drive gearbox. And the last criteria we're considering was whether it would be easy enough to turbocharge this engine. Now the Toyota G16e starts as turbocharged, so it gets a 5. And the Honda and Subaru, very easy to find turbos for those and a big community behind them. And likewise, there's a lot of available for the turbocharging of the Volvos as well. Now the Hyundai gets a 3 out of 5 here. It's not that common. There are turbochargers available for them. It's not a huge job to do, but it's not as easy as the other options. Now if we add up all of these scores, we see that the clear winner is the Honda K-Series. And that is why I have chosen to run a Subaru EJ in Project 171.
Now, before you get all really worried about me making a bad engineering decision here, let me assure you that I probably have. The Honda K-Series is an absolutely fantastic engine, and you can build a really good vehicle around it. But there is a lot of subjectivity that comes through on these decision matrix. The goal of these isn't necessarily to pick one winner versus another with, or based on one or two points. It's to see which of the options should be taken further in your considerations. But I would like to remind you that there's nothing really rational about building a custom sports car. Now in a previous video, I had stated that I wanted this project to be something in between a Porsche 550 and an Austin Healey, but something that's been modernized. And there's really not that much Porsche or Austin Healey about a turbocharged Honda motor. Whereas the boxer motor of a Subaru, a four cylinder boxer is much more reminiscent of some of those earlier Porsches. It's an engine that is regularly used in Volkswagens to update their power as well as being an engine that's often used in replicas of early Porsches. And the layout and aesthetics of the gearbox and an engine together is going to be much more reminiscent of some of the early uh, mid-engined prototype sports cars. But if you absolutely need these decision matrix to give you the answer that you're after, let's just add one more criteria to this. And it's a simple question. Is it a boxer? And all of the other engines, apart from the Subaru, get 0 out of 5. The Subaru gets 5. And now we have a new winner with 33 points, the Subaru EJ Series. Now, I'd love to hear from you in the comments as to whether you think I've made a bad choice with this engine or there's a different engine that maybe I should have considered. But regardless of whether you think I've made the right call or not, I hope you've enjoyed this video and I look forward to sharing more of Project 171 with you in future videos. Thank you for your time.